Hello and welcome to another video in this series as we journey from the very simple primes to the foothills of the Riemann hypothesis. Today we're going to be looking at a specific question um, which we've kind of overlooked a little bit recently um, and that is to show that the Riemann zeta function has only one um, pole or discontinuity um, in the region um, in sigma more than zero in the in the complex plane, the right hand side of it with real part more than zero. Um, it's actually true across the whole complex plane, but we haven't, we won't prove that today. Um, so we've been seeing pictures of it um, with one pole, <laughs> one discontinuity, but we haven't really proved it. So we're going to do that today. It's actually quite a nice proof, which um, um, I was inspired by um, somebody online, and I'll include the link to. The, uh, the suggestion so you can you can see the credits and and where it came from but it's quite nice because it turns a really difficult problem potentially into something that's quite neat so let's um, start at the beginning um, we initially had the series representation for the Riemann zeta function which was of this form 1 over n to the s and we know that um, it converges for sigma which is a real part of s more than one. Um, we've done that lots of times. So if you need a reminder, do go back and have a look at those videos and the previous blogs. Um, so that, that should be fairly kind of common knowledge by now. Now, because it converges in that region, it means that there are no discontinuities. There's no um, divergence in that um, region. There's nowhere where the magnitude of this function um, explodes to infinity. So that's nice, we can rule that huge area out. We are then left with the region between sigma between 0 and up to 1. We already know that at um, s equals 1 the, there is a divergence because that's the harmonic series 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4. That's the case when s equals 1 with no imaginary part. We, we know from the start that that diverges from, from the earliest part of this journey, we, we establish that. So that, that is there. And what we're going to show today is that that's the only pole. So this thing was only valid for sigma more than one. Then recently we made an exciting jump to a new expression, a new representation of the Riemann zeta function, which was valid for sigma more than zero, you can call that an analytic continuation. Essentially, we found a new expression for the Riemann zeta function, which agrees with this one for sigma more than one, but is actually valid for sigma more than zero. It's really nice, um, that, that kind of derivation. So have a look at the, I think it's the last video, and that's quite an exciting uh, jump that we did. So do go and have a look at that. This we know, again, have a look at the last video, is a is the eta function, which is the alternating zeta function. It's just this, but with um, plus minus plus minus signs between the terms. Um, and this thing, because of Dirichlet theory, converges for sigma more than zero. And again, we've looked at Dirichlet theory before, so do go and refresh yourselves on that video and that blog. Um, it enables us to work out when such series like this um, converge or diverge. And it's it's quite easy to see, uh, but again, have a look at that video. So if this converges for sigma one zero, that means this part can't contribute any divergence, any poles, um, any singularities um, to the Riemann zeta function, it must come from this factor. So we need to look at this to see when this factor converge, uh, diverges. By the way, we're using the terms singularity, discontinuity, divergence a little bit loosely, and we will tighten that up um, in a future video where we'll explore the true meaning of what a, you know, a singularity is and what a pole is. Um, for now, you can think of them as um, places where the function explodes to infinity. 
it diverges um, but we can add more um, meaning to that and we can quantify what kind of singularity what kind of divergence uh, it is uh, but we'll do that in future so don't worry about that today so that denominator actually let's write this out we've got the the, the Riemann zeta function is 1 over 1 minus 2 to the 1 minus s times the eta function and we know this converges for sigma more than zero which is the area we're interested in today we're not looking at sigma less than or equal to zero so if this converges that means any divergence must come from here and how does that happen well one over something diverges when that something is zero that is one minus two to the one minus s equals zero that means this thing has to equal one and two to the something for that to equal one that one minus s has to equal zero two to the zero is one so one minus s is zero straight away straight away that tells us that s equals one is one of those um, is where that divergence happens so let's look again at that we have said that the divergence happens when this bottom is zero and the we've already pulled out the trivial answer which is when s equals one because one minus one is zero two to zero is one one minus one means this is zero which gives us the divergence but actually because s is complex there are other possibilities as well and let's look at what they could be so when is 2 to the 1 minus s when is that 1 let's rewrite that to um, in the polar form so that's e to the 1 minus s ln 2 equals 1 this if we think of this as a complex number here it means that in the polar representation this polar this complex number can't point in any other direction other than straight to the right to be 1 that means s 1 minus s ln 2 has to be a multiple of 2 pi i n so if we divide that 1 over ln 2 and rearrange to get s equals 1 plus so we found multiple um, values of s which give us 2 to the 1 minus s equals 1 which gives us 0 here and that's it we, we, should, we knew that already but we just need we can forget it sometimes we overlook it so that's what we've said here we said the denominator the, of the factor 1 minus 2 to 1 minus s that's 0 and not just s is 1 but also s is 1 plus 2 pi i times some integer over log 2 and that's when that diverges so that suggests there's lots in fact an infinite number of divergences that come from that factor but when we visualize the Riemann zeta function we only saw one pole or one um, singularity um, obviously that was just a visualization so that's that's not um, proof that's just kind of um, evidence um, just in the region that we saw but it isn't proof let's remind ourselves so that was the three-dimensional uh, picture we drew of the magnitude of the um, Riemann zeta function in fact we took the log just to kind of ex ex you know, accentuate the features but here this 
thing that points right up. That was the um, singularity at s equals one, but we didn't see any more um, any more um, um, any more singularities. There might be, but we don't think there are. In fact, the truth is there aren't any more. But you know, we, we need to prove that. Let's look at a different version of this picture. So this is a um, 2D plot of the contours, the kind of the height contours of that function. And this time we've extended it to zero because that's that's how far we've got. And we saw that these is, look like zeros, but we saw there's one singularity and we couldn't see any more. So if there's only one singularity, actually let's 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 say that with um, our pictures so if this has one singularity and this we know has no singularities and this thing apparently has an infinite number of singularities how do we resolve this hmm well some singularities can be cancelled by zeros so for example, let me just kind of draw a rough picture. If I had a function which went to infinity like that, and then I multiplied it by another function which went to zero here, that zero could cancel that infinity, could. It's not always true. It depends on the type of singularity. And as I say, we'll come back to that topic. But if that is a removable singularity, as it's called, zero times that can be zero, which would result in just this singularity remaining. So this might be something like, and this one that was there, this one has been removed. So that means this thing has to remove all the singularities from here, except the one that remains, if there is indeed just one. So we have to prove what looks like quite a daunting task. We have to prove that all the zeros, well, enough of the zeros of this thing cancel the singularities, the infinite number of singularities from here, except this one at s equals one. That sounds like quite a difficult thing to do. And it sounds like quite a coincidence that the zeros from this eta function exactly match all the singularities from this factor, but leave just the s equals one alone. That sounds like quite a daunting task. Luckily, there is another approach. Um, and it's really quite nice. And as I suggest you have a look at the source. I'll link to it in the in the blog and the video description. It's really neat and it avoids um, directly trying to prove it. It does it in a slightly indirect way, but it's quite clever. It's not too difficult, and that's what we'll do now. So we just restated the the key point there. If that Riemann zeta function has only one pole at s equals one that eta function needs zeros at all of these points, one plus two pi i a over log two for integers a except zero, because we want to leave one singularity. It needs to cancel out all the other ones. That's, you know, that's quite a coincidence. And it seems like, as I said, quite a difficult thing to do. So we'll prove it in an interesting way. And what we're gonna do to do that is we're going to look at a another Dirichlet series, which we've deliberately constructed in a really special way. So again, it looks like the Riemann zeta function. In fact, it looks like the eta function, but the negatives are separated a little bit more. So instead of plus minus plus minus, it's plus plus minus plus plus minus. So it's at every third one, the negative sign. So it's three, six, nine, 12 have the negatives. And again, just like we did before, we can exploit the similarity between this and the Riemann zeta function. And we the standard thing to do is find the difference, which looks like this. 
Um, I won't go through it again because we did it before. That time we had twos, here we've got threes. So we end up with this expression and if we can isolate the Riemann, the zeta function here, and we end up with a new expression, yet another expression, yet another series for the Riemann zeta function. This is our third one so far. Remember the first one was the very simple one, one over n to the s. The next one had two here, and that was the eta function. Now we've got one which has a three, and this is a new series, which is this one here. In fact, you can see how we could keep making more um, series, uh, more representations like this. We could have a four and a five and so on, but this is sufficient for today. So this is quite exciting. Why is this useful? Well, let's let's think about it slowly. This series, this one here, also converges for sigma more than zero. That's again due to the Dirichlet theory, which we've covered before. Um, and the result of that theory is that we can inspect this and say, these factors, the sum of them is bounded and therefore the abscissa of convergence is sigma equals zero. So it converges to the right of that. So there are no poles from this. There might be zeros, but no poles, no singularities. That means the singularities in the Riemann zeta function must come from this factor. And that's parallel to what we said here. We said the the singularity must come from here. It looks like we haven't made much progress. It looks like we've done the same thing twice. But actually, there is a nice bit of logic which helps us. We've said the Riemann zeta function is 1 over 1 minus 2 to the 1 minus s of eta of s. And we've also found the Riemann zeta function is 1 over 1 minus 3 to the 1 minus s of a new Dirichlet series. And I'll just choose a different color. And we said that this thing doesn't contribute any singularities, only zeros. And this thing also doesn't contribute any singularities, sigma one zero. Therefore, the singularities must come from here. And we've already shown that this thing has singularities at s equals one plus two pi i a integer over log two. And by a similar process, we can say that the singularities here come from s equals one plus two pi i, let's call that another integer b, over log two. Mm, does that help us? It does. What it says is that the singularities come from here, could come from here, the singularity in here could come from here, and the singularity in here could come from here. That means we can equate these two. Let's slowly think about what the logic is there, because it took me a while to kind of really get it. What it's saying is that the, this factor contributes singularities, which may be cancelled by the eta function. This thing contributes singularities, which may be cancelled by this x Dirichlet series. However, whatever ends up in the Riemann zeta function must come from here and here. So we can equate the two conditions because they both could contribute singularities to the Riemann zeta function. And let's do that. So we've got one plus two pi i a over ln two 
that's where the singularities could be, equals 1 plus 2 pi i b over ln2 and a and b are integers. Cancel the 1s. Oh sorry, that should be a ln3 there. Uh, cancel the 2 pi i's. We can then say a over b equals log 2 over log 3. What does that tell us? Well, this is irrational. And if a and b are integers, there can be no a and b. a and b more than um, or not zero. There's no a's and b's that are non-zero that satisfy this. That means we've excluded a and b non-zero as contributing to the poles of the Riemann zeta function. That's how we eliminate all those other possibilities to say that there can only be the, a pole potentially at a, b both equals zero, but this, this doesn't give us information about that. What we've just done is excluded all the other possibilities. And that's how we prove, at least for sigma more than zero, that's important, that there are no other um, singularities in the Riemann zeta function. So we've said that series converges for sigma more than zero, so it, its factor, its divergence must come from that factor, which has zeros at this s. Looks very similar to the other one, except there's a log three. And then we equate them. These are the two expressions for where the poles of s could be. It's important to say could be. And then we end up with a over b is irrational. And there's no non-zero integer a's and b's would satisfy this. So that means that Riemann zeta function doesn't have any poles for a and b that are integers that are non-zero. That just leaves us with the possibility that a and b could be zero, which corresponds to s equals one. And that's how we do it. That's quite neat, isn't it? Um, it took me a while to actually get this, um, although it looks fairly simple. It just took me a while to think through what the logic actually is saying. So do kind of you know, play with it with pen and paper yourself. If it doesn't make sense, do comment and we'll kind of look at it again. Um, it, I have to say, it took me a few goes to get it, but it's quite ingenious, I think. Um, fantastic. Great. We'll see you next time.